Hello, Internet. My name is Daniel. It's officially pronounced D O B O'Brien, and welcome to another wet episode of Obsessive Pop Culture Disorder, the only show on the Internet that tries to incorporate a new word that I learn in every episode. Today's truculent episode explores. Movies have protagonists. There's no way around that. We have a person or persons we care about and we want them to learn a lesson and succeed. Everyone who gets in their way on that path to clarity is generally a villain at the worst and forgettably disposable at the least. Movies try to make things as black and white as possible with clear heroes and clear villains so we don't feel bad for the people who lose to ensure that the protagonist wins. But every once in a while, they miss the mark. There are some unexplored casualties of popular movies and I'm gonna talk about them because this is my show and that's what I've decided to do with it. Captain America Winter Soldier is the best Captain America movie so far. We see what life has been like for Captain America in the modern world, easily weaving PTSD in with a fun and tight espionage movie, plus the undeniable sexual tension between Cap and Bucky. I'm with you to the end of the line, pal. Cap spends the movie trying to reach and save Bucky, who is not only his friend, but his last connection to the past life that he knew. Bucky's been brainwashed, and Cap tries everything he can to make Bucky snap out of his programming. When punching doesn't work, Cap breaks into a museum and steals the original Captain America uniform that had been on display in a glass case, hoping that the old uniform will jog Bucky's memory. This leads to a cameo from Stan Lee, my friend, who, as the overnight security guard at the museum, is the one to stumble upon the missing uniform. He says, I am so fired, and the audience laughs because, hey, it's Stan Lee, and hey, he's fired. But like, yeah, he's definitely fired. They never specifically aged the character of museum nighttime guard, but he's in his 90s. That's a 90-something man who still has to work doing his fucking best. And the next day, his 27-year-old boss is gonna pull him into an office and be like, world famous enemy of the state broke into the museum, stole an iconic decades old piece of history, and you didn't notice anything until it was too late. Doesn't look good, Stan. The costume is one of the reasons people travel to this museum and pay the entrance fee, Stan. What are we supposed to do, Stan? There is someone on staff at that museum who has been looking for a reason to fire the incredibly old security guard, and this is all the ammo they needed. Do you think they're gonna just go easy on him just because it turns out Cap only stole the costume to remind a time-traveling assassin that they used to be buddies? That changes nothing. Stan blew it at work, and he should get fired. There was a 90-something-year-old man picking up some extra money by working the graveyard shift, and now he's out on the street. It's on you, Captain America. In Mrs. Doubtfire, Robin Williams has to dress up as a sweet Scottish lady and pose as a nanny in a misguided attempt to be closer to his children. And these must be the cherubs. He does a bunch of voices. Don't fuss with me. There are some shenanigans. There's obviously a scene where he has to balance dinner with his family as his whittled alter ego, Mrs. Doubtfire, and a dinner with his boss as himself at the same time in the same restaurant. Okay. It is, in general, one of the most 90s movies ever made. In between shenanigans and montages set to Aerosmith songs, we meet a sweet old bus driver played by the late Sidney Walker. Good evening, dear. Evening, ma'am. Williams as Doubtfire has to take a late bus home from work most nights, and this bus driver is usually the only other person on the bus. When he sees her, he smiles and sweetly flirts with her. It's cute. Cold night, isn't it? Yes, it is. Hope you have something nice and warm to go home to. And the audience watching along is supposed to laugh because, ah, the bus driver doesn't realize he's flirting with a guy. In the 90s, sometimes a guy accidentally liking another guy was all it took for something to be considered a joke. And like, I'm sorry, we're sorry. Anyway, I don't know what went wrong in my brain, but I think about that bus driver all the time. To begin with, he's a lonely old man who works the lay shift for a bus that is almost always empty. He's obviously single, which means his wife either died or left him, or he still hasn't managed to find someone yet. Then he meets a woman who seems sweet and seems his age and isn't rebuffing his advances, so he probably suspects she's single. Available women his age are probably hard to come by, and now he's found a pretty one that actually seems to like him. He must feel pretty lucky. He also seems like just the sweetest man. When he sees Mrs. Doubtfire's bare legs covered in the thick and wild fur that is Robin Williams' natural pelt, he doesn't balk or abandon his flirtation like some other more shallow men might. He accepts Mrs. Doubtfire, woolly legs and all, as natural, healthy, just the way God made you. I like that Mediterranean looking women. <laughs> natural, healthy, just the way God made you. But he broke the mold when he made me, dear. I think about this man and the way he looks and smiles at Mrs. Doubtfire, and I can't help but think that seeing this woman and briefly getting the opportunity to flirt with her is the highlight of his day. I relate to this guy. I've been this guy. It's been a long day of hard, lonely work, but for five minutes, I made a girl laugh or made her smile. 
five minutes, I was charming. So no matter what else happened that day, that's a day that goes down in the record books as one of the good days. Sometimes seeing the courage you muster to flirt with a stranger, rewarded with the smile of a pretty girl, is enough to carry you through fucking anything. Mrs. Doubtfire gets her own TV show by the end of the movie. That means the bus driver is gonna see it, check the credits, find out that it's Robin Williams in a wig, and just crash. I'm not saying this is a crying game situation where he'll freak out because he's horrified at being attracted to a man. I'm saying. He'll be crushed when he finds out that this harmless nightly flirting ritual with the attractive stranger was just a bunch of bullshit. It was probably hard enough on the bus driver when Mrs. Doubtfire suddenly stopped showing up on his bus route. Now he has to find out that she doesn't even exist? Maybe he's got a brother or a sister or some nieces, nephews, grandnieces, grandnephews, and they're like, uncle unnamed bus driver? What happened to that woman on the bus you were telling us about? Did you ever ask her out? And he just has to stare off and not answer because the real answer is too depressing because the real answer is, she was never real. She was a costumed straight man in a costume doing a character, and I'll never understand why he kept the character going when it was just the two of us on a bus. The best part of my nights, the thing I wrote home about, was based on a lie. It was hasty of me to tell you about her. And that's way too sad and embarrassing. I like to think that things worked out for the bus driver, but, like, how? In The Mighty Ducks, Coach Bombay, a ruthless lawyer, gets arrested for drunk driving. And instead of serving the up to 90 days in prison that is standard in Minnesota, he's sentenced to community service in the form of coaching a peewee hockey team. District 5 peewee hockey team. I'm Gordon Bombay. I'm the new coach. <laughs> Bombay's team is a pack of wacky smart aleck misfits with hearts of gold. And after some initial growing pains, the kids grow to love and respect Coach Bombay. And he, in turn, learns a valuable lesson about how the criminal justice system is disproportionately lenient on white offenders. Oh, I'm sorry. He learns to believe in himself and be nicer to people. The Scrappy Ducks spend the movie feuding with the snooty, well-to-do suburbanite Hawks. Coach Bombay realizes that due to redistricting laws, the fancy Hawks star player Adam Banks should actually be playing on the Ducks, because you know how uh, redistricting historically benefits disenfranchised poor people? Anyway, star player Adam Banks joins the Ducks, and they end up defeating the Hawks and really becoming a family. A brief but necessary aside about child-aimed sports movies. I've been critical of a few Mighty Ducks plot points that seem tone deaf now when viewed through a modern lens, but let me be clear, I love this friggin' movie. And if you were a kid in the early 2000s, or if you're a kid right now, as always, don't watch this show because of the language and the rightfully assumed inebriation. You really got, or are currently getting, screwed or fucked because no one is making good sports movies for you. The 90s was the golden age of young kids' sports movies and nobody talks about it. Three Mighty Ducks, Little Giants, Little Big League, Rookie of the Year, Angels in the Outfield, Space Jam, the mother Sandlot, are you kidding me? If we age on up a little bit for adult-oriented movies, the 90s gave us Rudy and White Men Can't Jump, both perfect movies. We were spoiled for choice. We had amazing, iconic, coming-of-age, underdog sports movies for every single sport. Did Hollywood just decide after the perfect movie sports decade that was the 90s that it was time to just close up shop? The second Mighty Ducks movie had an ice skating cowboy. My childhood was perfect. Why aren't we trying to replicate that for future children? End of brief but necessary aside. Anyway. Who got screwed in this movie? Oh, all the hawks. They might not have had the unique individual quirks of each and every duck, but they were an objectively superior hockey team, probably because of their discipline and work ethic. The coach of the hawks and coach Bombay were engaged in some kind of decades-long pissing match, but the hawk players weren't engaged in that. They were hard-working children who really liked hockey and practiced it all the time. Whatever. I just want to play hockey. They built their team around their leader. And then in the middle of the season, some drunk driving lawyer was like, I'm gonna take your star player by exploiting a districting loophole. That won't disrupt anything, right? It hurts any team to lose anyone in the middle of a season, let alone a star player. They were pacing to win. And then this blood money funded squad of misfits out of nowhere, out of fucking nowhere, shows up and snatches their best guy. The Golden State Warriors got KD from Oklahoma in the off season. They didn't take LeBron from the Cavs before the finals because one of Bron's houses happened to be located in an Oakland district. Those kids did nothing wrong, and they had to watch their former captain own the sh out of them because it was the only way the soulless lawyer coach of the Ducks could actually win. You know, this movie starts with Bombay's lawyer buddies criticizing him for being too ruthless in the courtroom. Next time, a little restraint might be in order. And then by the end of the movie, he is recruiting child players from opposing teams in the pursuit of winning. I'm starting to think Coach Bombay didn't learn anything at all. Stuart Little is an adorable movie about a family that decides to break social norms and adopt a talking mouse as their new child. At first, their human son George is like, that mouse isn't my brother, and their cat, like, cat, Snowbell, is like, I don't want to f*** that mouse. But by the end of the movie, George comes to accept Stuart as his brother, and the cat... dies? No. That can't be right. Cat wouldn't die. The cat doesn't die. Save the cat. Uh, the cat doesn't die. The cat decides to also 
uh, go against biologically necessary norms and accepts the mouse as an equal in the food chain. It's a great film about love and acceptance and family. One small problem. The little family didn't set out to adopt a mouse. They wanted a new child. George wanted a little brother. So they went to an orphanage where a bunch of orphans are and they were so charmed by the talking mouse that they just had to have it. Even the woman who ran the orphanage was like, we normally discourage people from adopting outside of their own species. We try to discourage couples from adopting children outside their own species. Which is the diplomatic way of saying, yo, rethink this. It's a mouse. The average lifespan of a mouse is two years. The oldest mouse in history is like four years old. And also, they shit all the time and they don't technically have any rights. And finally, if you're really gonna do this, if you're so horned up to get a mouse today, please don't do it in front of actual human orphan children. These kids live every day hoping they get adopted. How are they gonna feel when you show up and you're like, the mouse with shoes is pretty cool, I'll take his ass. That's insane. You're torturing all of these kids for no reason. You're making the orphans watch you adopt a mouse? That's not even a situation, you dopey fucks. I was so curious about this movie's message that I tracked down a website that specifically covers movies that feature adoption to determine if it's a fair portrayal or if it sends a bad message or could potentially be triggering. The website is called Adoption at the Movies and they work as a resource to help families with adopted children connect their experiences with wholesome films. How dope is that? Anyway, on Stuart Little, they said, quote, there's a lot of concerning stuff here. His brother rejects him. The family pet tries to get him killed by mobsters. Stuart is kidnapped by people posing as his birth parents. We learn that Stuart's actual birth parents were killed when they were crushed by cans in a grocery accident. Stuart's adoption agency places him without even visiting the home, and this puts Stuart in danger. Although this could be a lighthearted film for some viewers, it's probably a safe one to skip for most adoptive families. And the f quote. And that doesn't even touch on the orphans who had to watch and be like, are you sure that anthropomorphic mouse with an adult man's voice would be a better young child than me? A young child? Are you sure you want to reject me in this dramatic of a fashion? I guess it's nice that the little family is happy, but damn, I do not care. They gave a massive bed and a bedroom to a mouse. Oh, that's it for this month. Tune in next month when we'll cover why hasn't a cool sponsor gotten behind this show? It does consistently good traffic and costs zero dollars to produce because we film in our office and our in-house editor Nick Rude edits every episode ever since our former editor Noel Wells stopped doing it. And wait, watch that. Saturday Night Live alum and writer-director star of major motion picture and Mr. Roosevelt, Noel Wells used to edit this show. Yes, that's right. She edited the first few episodes. And anyway, isn't it weird that I can't get Chili's to send us a few grand to sponsor this show? Like, that's f***ing insane. I love Chili's and this show costs no money and its alumni have gone on to SNL and I talk about Chili's all the time. Just give us like a hundred grand and I'll talk about you for a year on a popular internet show. I'll eat your f***ing Southwestern egg rolls at the start and close of every episode. The economics of internet writing is insane right now and a hundred grand is nothing to you. Please, Chili's. Whoa. Does not feel like there's enough material there for a full episode, but yeah, definitely Chili's, get at me. Give us a hundred grand. You'll help keep the site going. Bye. Hey everybody, thank you for watching that. Make sure you click the big C in the middle to subscribe. Click any of the videos that look like good videos to watch them. Click the YouTube fucking stupid bell to get notifications when we make new videos. And in the comments, no, don't go to the comments. Go to, do like hashtag OPCD Chilies and get that shit trending.